we're having things ranging from lectures to discussions to spontaneous things, and anybody who wants to offer something can organize something, and you can see me afterwards about proposing something, getting on the schedule. Um, what I um, wanted to do today is to start a discussion about anarchism, psychology, and law, different aspects of that, partly because it's an area that I've been paying attention to and teaching about and writing about for a long time, and for me it ties very much into the actual kinds of work that we're trying to do here and it's similar political efforts around the country and around the world. Um, and usually when people talk about um, anarchism, it's, it's sort of from a political or philo philosophical perspective. As a social psychologist, I tend to think more in terms of psychology and how that ties into the political work we do and the changes we want to see in society. So, so that's kind of my perspective, where I'm coming from in that. So rather than just talk for a long time, I'd like to talk a little and ask questions and have some discussion and, and keep throwing in more. Um, we can schedule more discussions over the next few weeks or months or whatever it is on different aspects of it. I wasn't intending this to be kind of an anarchism 101, what is anarchism discussion, but we can try to answer those questions too. And, and I know there are other people here who can answer those questions here in other places and, and and there are a lot of, a lot of anarchists here who, who know different parts of the history and theory and the practice better than I do. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to um, be the voice on anarchism or, or anything else. Um, I wanted to start by asking what comes to your mind when you think, when you hear the word anarchy. Just throw out a few words. Violence. Community. Just speak louder. Community. She said violence. Chaos. Mutual aid and voluntary cooperation. <laughs> Anarchist cookbook. So, so quite a disparity of takes. What about anarchism? Uh, what is law, lawlessness also. Well, what is anarchism? Mutual aid. Well, how is anarchism different from anarchy? Or is it? Anarchy is the state. Uh, it's a it's a form of political um, organization. Yes, anarchy anarchy has an organization. It's we are anarchists. We have anarchism means no ruler. So we are an anarchy. Anarchism is a philosophy, and um, you don't have to be you don't have to live in anarchy to be an anarchist. What about psychology? What do you think of when you hear the word psychology? Human behavior. Mind. Thought process. Human nature. What do you think of when you hear human nature? It doesn't exist. <laughs> Diverse. Versus People's nurture. People's tendencies. People's tendencies. And the last one, law. What does law mean to you? Control, violence, indecision. Organization. Oh, sorry. Oppression. Organization. Governing principles. So, so for all of these terms, there's a big range of perspectives, and within each of within each of those, within psychology, within anarchism, within legal scholarship, there are debates about just what those terms mean and, and how they came about historically and 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 what you do based on your understanding of it. Um, anarchism, the philosophy of anarchism, uh, to me has always uh, been based from its beginnings um, as a, a revolutionary movement in the 1800s, in, in, the, in the 1800s uh, into the 1900s, has always been a movement that has sought two things, and sometimes very clearly clarified even in 120, 130 years ago. Anarchists, um, are people who believe in individual autonomy and not being told what to do. Anarchists also believe in community, in mutual aid, in establishing a way of cooperation between people. So that the, the media image of anarchy is violent and chaos and people just doing their own thing is very much um, different from the actual practice of anarchists throughout the past century and a half who have been working very hard to create community, to figure out 
how people can create a society that works without hierarchy. And so, you know, those of you who are mostly have read about the 60s, you know, there was this notion of do your own thing. Everyone wanted to do your own thing, but people wanted to do that in communes and co-ops and collectives. People weren't off on their own doing their own thing, which is a very a much more recent, I think, Americanized notion of individualist anarchy, which doesn't have a whole lot in common with the traditional uh, anarchist movement over the years, which was always very much a movement of the left, not an individualist movement, but a movement of trying to be an individual in community and figuring out how to create that. Anarchy, anarchism is an experiment in creating um, ways of organization in communities and movements organizations and in society at large and it's an unfinished experiment and we're experimenting here I know most people who are at this occupation aren't anarchists don't consider themselves anarchists but the model of organization is essentially an anarchist model of organization using the language that anarchists have developed over uh, a long time and especially and in, in, very interestingly for people in Boston in the Boston area, New England area, since the 1970s anti-nuclear movement, the movement against the Seabrook nuclear plants in New Hampshire, which was heavily um, organized along anarchist principles, um, developing notions of consensus, of uh, affinity group decision-making, of direct action. A lot of the language that is still involved in the movement came out of that period in the late 70s in New England and across the country. Food not bombs, spike not bombs, food not bombs, which is in charge of our food here. These are anarchist organizations that came out of that anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s. Food not bombs is not in charge of food. Food not bombs Right. And it's an important point. There are anarchists in every tent here in working groups doing the work of helping organize things, not saying, I'm an anarchist and I'm doing this, but this is the way anarchists operate. And so it's not just kind of young people hiding their faces, um, causing disruption, um, and that's a part of anarchism and something we can talk about, but that's not what anarchism is. And, and I think so for people who, who just think of anarchy as chaos and inability to get things done, it's important to keep in mind that even, even in something like this, the anarchists are everywhere helping keep things going with everybody else. One of the problems of having two goals, of wanting both a society that helps us be individuals and a society that works with cooperation and mutual aid, is that sometimes these goals conflict with one another. So there's a tension between trying to be myself and trying to be concerned about and working with other people. Anarchists have been talking and writing about this for 130 years, talking about the difficulty of changing society and changing ourselves at the same time. We want a society that works to teach people to be cooperative, to teach people to work together, but we didn't grow up in a society that taught us how to do that. So we're all struggling to do that. Anarchists of different kinds, of different tendencies, talked about the importance of cooperation, even though individually they might be competitive. They talk about getting rid of uh, possessiveness, even though we might like our iPods. You know, they talk about um, uh, not being uh, jealous in relationships, but we get jealous. You know, there are all kinds of things that anarchists have focused on, always with this realization that we can't just decide to be different if we don't change the structures of society that make us what we are. And, and um, so that tension, so, it, so to me it means that we don't really have the answers, all we have is a goal and uh, different ways of trying to reach that through different, different ways of organizing over time. This, this sort of tension between the individual and others, the individual and society, is also essential to psychology, to different parts of psychology, to the way uh, children develop and child development is, is, is very much a study of how young children focused on themselves and their own needs learn uh, about the needs of others and learn to empathize and work with others and be part of a community personality theory, all kinds of personality theories from left to right, and personality theories are very political. There's nothing very scientific about them. Personality theory is a political enterprise on what it means to be human. But wherever, wherever that theory is, it talks about this tension between individuality and mutuality, using different terms in different places, agency and communion. 
um, uh, autonomy and sense of community. Different areas of psychology talk about it in different ways. But that, but that tension is there. And, and you have different therapies. If you go, if you decide you want to see a therapist, that therapist will be will have been trained in a particular way of figuring out how those pieces fit together, a, fig, a particular way of the model of what the ideal human, healthy human being is. Uh, so there's a sign up there. I don't know who put it up, but it's an antidepressant protest. And I'm not actually sure who put up there what it's about, but there's. You know, there's a lot of critique of the psychology industry for moving towards a medical model of uh, defining every behavior as um, a pathology, as a neurosis, as something that's wrong, and coming up with a method or recently a pill to fix it. And it's a very controversial area within radical psychology circles, and, and, um, and for that reason, a lot of anarchists have their critiques of psychology as a discipline, as a field, because psychologists traditionally play a very significant role in pacifying the population. There's an awful lot of psychologists working in prisons, working in schools, even working in factories, working to help people put up with a lousy life situation, and rather than focusing us on how to change the life situation, we focus on, well, what can I do to change myself so I can get through a bad situation? And As a professional educator, do you find that uh, there is a lot of pressure from the pharmaceutical industry, like you see in a lot of other forms of medicine and agriculture, that is, you know, uh, you know because they fund the medical schools and they fund, uh, you know, you know, get a lot of their funding from the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly true with, with the, the medical psychiatric. I think that that is an issue, and and there are there are groups of anarchist mental health consumers, anarchist um, mental health workers who have been very much interested in in this area of medicalizing, uh, converting our problems, our, our, when millions of people across the country have the same problem, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to define that as an individual problem. If millions of people hate their jobs, it's not just an individual problem to figure out what to do about that. That's the American way. It's not really the anarchist way, and I don't think it's really the healthy way. You know, instead it makes sense to figure out, well, why do so many millions of people hate their jobs? Why do so many people hate, hate spending their time shopping for, for fun? You know, you know why, why is it so many people do that? So anarchists ha have picked up on this notion that the things that we take for granted as fun, the things that we take for granted as what, you know, that makes us feel good when we spend money, the things that make us feel good when we own something. You know, there are, there are reasons in the culture that um, anarchists have focused on. And there's a, there's a, 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 a lot of research now by anthropologists on really I think is the most valuable thing for people who are interested in anarchism to study is anthropology because anthropology presents variations of what people take to be human nature and human society. We grew up in a society and we think this is, this is normal. This is what everyone wants. This is the best way to be. I can't imagine things being different except for people who are unfortunate in some way. Anthropologists, I think, have a much better sense of the, the very big v variety of things that people take for granted in terms of you know, cooperation, competition, leadership, decision-making, possessiveness, um, all, all of those um, kinds of things. And people want to jump in and have yeah, questions or comments about this, different perspectives. I know there are people here from different traditions and perspectives. Does it make sense to people? Does it? Is it... Well, when you talk about psychology, uh, obviously the word anarchy, as you pointed out before, has a lot of negative uh, implications. Like if Frank Luntz was advising this group, they'd say, change the name to something more, uh, you know, user-friendly. Because as we see in this, this group here, you know, uh, even though we all individually have felt this, you know, the feelings that brought us out here, the feelings of frustration and anger and uh, all that other stuff that brought us out here, this didn't just start two weeks ago. But the fact that we're all coming together as a community inspired us all to come down here. We didn't come down here as individuals, we came down here as a group. And, um, you know, 
perhaps going back to the psychology of it, just by merely changing the name of anarchy to something more friendly. I don't think it makes sense to change the name of something. I don't think it makes sense to change the name of such a long-lasting tradition. I think it makes sense to change the perception. And the name is yeah. beautiful and perfect. It comes from the way you said before. It comes from Greek. It's great. It means without without rulers. rulers yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think you know this is something I think that people talk about. I, I do my part. I wear my my my, my white anarchist hat yeah. instead of a black uh, yeah. instead of a bandana. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, the thing about anarchism and why it's perceived as um, violent and scary. I'm going to ask a weird question. Does anybody know about tower parts? Has anybody heard about that? Okay. Do you know about the tower? There is a card in the tarot deck called the tower, the tower, and people look at it is really a vision. The picture of it is a crumbling tower. It's hit by lightning and it's crumbling down. People look at that and say, "Oh no, oh no!" But what it is, what it symbolizes when you read the tarot is what you gotta break down in order to build something new. Um, there's. Uh, there's versions of that in, I think, Hinduism as well. Um, what? Is it in nature? In nature. I mean, you've got to break things down before you build it up. And that's why it's scary. Change is scary. So speaking of breaking things down, <laughs> I want to talk about law. I do want to mention just quickly, though, that there is a long tradition of radical psychology, radical psychiatry, radical therapy. Um, a lot of people in radical movements are familiar with Wilhelm Reich's radical therapy um, in, in Germany. He wrote about uh, the rise of fascism. Um, he was uh, someone who broke away from Freud. He was influenced by a psychologist, uh, Otto Gross, who was an anarchist and, and wrote a lot and did developed anarchist radical therapy in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There are, there are other radical therapies that have um, persisted. Uh, something from uh, the South Latin America called somatherapy is still around. It's sort of a, a body-mind kind of therapy. Um, and so there is, there is a lot of that. Uh, there's an organization called Rad Radical Psychology Network, uh, R-A-D-D-S-Y-N-E-T dot org, if anyone's interested in that. Law, the development of law is something that um, is a huge, huge um, area of study. There, there are, um, if you're interested in the way law developed and radical takes on law, you know, you can search on critical legal studies, which is the name of the school of legal theory that critiques the nature of law and looks at the way law operates in a society. And you know, one thing we, we grow up with is this notion that um, we need law in order to function as a society, that law is a good thing, that um, law sets um, the rules we can all live by. Uh, people who have studied legal history kind of go through the history of law, and this is where anthropology comes in. Also, kind of looking at the development of law within the last um, eight or 10,000 years as hunter-gatherer and small village societies um, developed agriculture in cities and, and centralized. Right. The common law of England, and our law is based in large part on the common law of England, the common law of England wasn't something that happened to represent the way things were done in England. The common law in England was an effort by the monarchy to get rid of all of the, the local customs all around Britain. There were, people did things differently in different ways. The monarchy didn't like that, and they went out and they, they imposed this common law on the rest of Britain in order to have one legal code that would work for the monarchy, would work for the merchant class, and would be predictable, which is what commerce likes. Uh, and law has spread like that around the world, and we see national and international um, legal and quasi-legal organizations trying to do the same thing. Someone spoke here a day or two ago about the spread of um, law related to free trade, law related to the International Monetary Fund requiring countries around the world to change their legal codes to match this international legal system that centralizes power and centralizes economic power in particular. 